people. We've got CTOs and Enterprise Transformation with Rashid Kapoor from HSBC, Ramin Kress from Henkel, my eyesight's going off a little bit, Lindsay Trout, a partner at Egon Zender, and Mark Sassaruth, the chairman of SK and Sassaruth. Over to you, please. Wonderful. Good morning to everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure being here. And maybe even before we start, uh, I was just saying to Manuela, who was on stage, making things real and being simplistic about it, I think is one of the best virtues you can have in the world, which is full of acronyms and where many don't understand anymore what we're talking about. So highly resonated. I'm Ramin Kress. Uh, I'm the CEO of Henkel. And before I introduce this incredible panel to you, I have taken this role uh, just about two years ago, and I've done a number of different things before. Um, and the biggest excitement that I had of becoming a CDO of you know, a DAX company in Germany, which is a multinational around the world, was really how big organizations in today's world are facing disruption how they're attacking it, and how one has the opportunity in the role of the CDO to be part of shaping the future and maybe not look at disruption and not as to how to fight back, but develop something very proactive that has a good feeling about wanting to be part of how to shape the future economy as a large multinational. And so, from my personal perspective, I believe that large multinational organizations have more than a fair chance to succeed in the future if they manage to reinvent themselves, if they pivot to the new, and how do you do it? I personally think there's no cookie cutter approach to how to do that. Every organization needs to identify their own strategy but there are a couple of ingredients that I think hold true as to how you can do that and how you do that well. And in my experience and what we have built with Henkel, one of the very first and probably most important aspects is to realize that you cannot do it on your own. And by that, I mean you need to build relationships, partnerships, for which we build Henkel X as an ecosystem that is built on the philosophy of three main pillars, which is the ecosystem, experiments, and experimentation. And we have built a mentorship program, and very pleased to have a third of the Henkel X mentors, where 170 made up of venture capitalists, entrepreneurs, and Forge 100 C-suite that are here at COGX today, and we collaborate together to innovate together and drive that agenda forward. So I have two roles, and the role of the CDO, which we're talking about today, I have one set that I believe is CDO can only be successful if at the time when he takes the job, gives himself, depending on the organization he goes into, a timeline to achieve the digital transformation. Because what I believe in that after having set the baseline of the initial hurdle to get above the hump of transformative activities, you must have built the baseline and thereafter you need to reintegrate those activities into the core business and then transformation becomes innovation, which large corporates have been doing for 200 plus years but it cannot be an isolated ivory tower. So in other words, you start your job, you say when you need to have worked yourself out of a job, and then with a vengeance, you provoke, you aggravate, and you shake the cage to really drive change. Because if you don't do that, then you're gonna be the paradise bird that is a lonesome soldier somewhere on the side, and it becomes very lonely and very difficult. So in our case, we are very close in concluding, as Henkel, within less than two years, our first phase of the digital transformation, recognizing that transformation is the new constant, 
and therefore implementing the new constant as innovation where it belongs into the business units and the functions. So that is my introduction to my little story. And uh, we're going to kick off with you, Lindsay. You have uh, done an amazing research on a number of paradise birds. Most of the CDOs only exist somewhere around three years, mm -hmm. by and large. Many come disillusioned and leave, <laughs> um, and they go somewhere else. But please share with us, and thank you so much for coming all the way from California. It's very clear the London weather is better. <laughs> and it's lovely to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, good morning. My name is Lindsay Trout. I'm a partner at Aegon Zinder, where I lead our global digital practice. And I welcome you. Oh, not that far. I welcome you to the era of distortion. Not transformation and not disruption, but distortion. Like many of you, my business training was grounded in Michael Porter's five forces. What a clear and clean construct, right? You have the com competition, company, customers, suppliers, so clean and clear. But today, it's not so clean and clear, is it? It's fuzzy. It's like a distortion field, because you hardly know your emerging customer. Your supplier, your partner, he's now your frenemy, because you live in an ecosystem. And your competition is best seen only with a periscope. This is the era of distortion. And the playbook of yesterday and the assumptions of yesteryear no longer apply. So what do we know? We know we face compression, because the rate of change has accelerated. Timelines are compressed, and speed matters. We hear collision. Now, we used to euphemistically call this convergence, but I'll challenge that today, because it sounds a lot more like a collision than convergence, when value chains are being reconstructed and power being reset. And third, we celebrate creators, because with the information that's broadly available today, the technology and the tools, in every pocket of the planet, we have creators defining new solution for today's reality. And so what do companies do as they face this? Well, many will hire a chief digital officer. We at Aegon Zender, we advise on leadership and transformation. And we hear a great deal of anxiety and ambiguity on the topic of chief digital officers. And as such, we embarked on a study recently of 100 chief digital officers across industries and across the globe, representing over a trillion dollars in revenue. Today at COGX, we released that study, of course, available on our website. And so what do we know? What do we know about a chief digital officer? Well, the majority of them report to a CEO. The majority of them are the first individuals holding that remit in their organization. And the majority of them were not just hired outside of their company, but outside of their industry. What else do chief digital officers have in common? <laughs> Turns out, not much. <laughs> um, half of them have a P&L, half of them don't. They come from a variety of different functional backgrounds, and they're hired in to drive innovation. It's a commercial remit to monetize existing customers and prospective customers in new ways. And what they share with us passionately is a common challenge, and that is culture. That's right. It's the artifacts, the language, the systems and processes by which we organize ourselves and claim an identity. For example, culture. How, do you, how does your company identify with its data? How do you organize around meetings and budgets? Do you over-celebrate compliance? It is culture that's seen as either the impediment or the enabler to enterprise transformation. As referenced, a chief digital officer is a change agent. And by definition, it is therefore a temporal role. Depending on the company and the remit, 
the role is likely to persist for two to five years. And so what happens when a chief digital officer role dissipates? Because the imperative does not. We still need to evolve to modernize and embrace technology. When the chief digital officer role dissipates, it becomes incumbent on all of you and each of you to carry the remit forward. And so what does that mean in the era of distortion? It means that the leadership imperative is around courage and culture. Courage because it takes a lot to drive change in an organization, to challenge cultural norms. We find that 75% of chief digital officers, they say that when they joined the organization, it wasn't ready for transformation. And as such, they're three times more likely to be evangelizing versus executing. Evangelizing is tapping into the heart, not just the mind. It's getting people on board to believe what can be. And that's why it's linked to courage, because it comes from the French word for heart, la coeur. So I invite all of us as leaders of tomorrow to embrace our own courage, to lead from the heart, to grab our periscope and look around corners to drive this change, and to take a very keen eye towards culture. How are we behaving? Because that will define the power that, em that enables our performance. Thank you for your time, and enjoy the future. Thank you, Andy. Um, without further ado, so we can start with the hard questions that I prepared. <laughs> Raksha, do you want to give us an overview of your power speech? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Um, so as Ramin mentioned, I'm the group chief tier officer for HSBC. Uh, been with the bank for about two years now. Uh, we are all interested in the survey. Thank you so much, Lindsay. One of the key metrics of the CDO's tenorship, I don't know if you see other statistics, the average tenorship of a CDO or a chief data officer in a global bank or a big company is around two and a half years. And I feel that I just crossed that uh, recently, so I kind of across, across the border. Um, and again, as you said, Lindsay, it's so critical. Uh, courage is really important aspect of how do you fit in a culture and how you drive change and transformation um, in an organization like ours. A little bit of background about HSBC. Uh, we are in 60 plus countries, global bank, one of the top five biggest banks in the world from a market capitalization uh, perspective. Large customer base, diverse set of products as well. Um, data is part of the DNA for our strategy as well. Digital and data both combined together. As the experience for the customer keeps changing, the expectations that customers have of a bank is very similar to what they would have from any fintech or a startup. For HSB to start innovating and making sure that we don't get disrupted or distorted, we have to continue to evolve and reinvent ourselves. So I would say there's uh, six pillars of the data strategy that we have embarked on. First being customer centricity. We want to start with what the customers expect from us. Does the data and the digital experience provide us with a, a single view or a consistent view of a customer across product lines and the geographies we serve? Second really is around the data foundation or the key basics from a data point of view, hygiene factor. Do we have the data appropriately governed? Is the quality of the data accurate or not? Is it timely or not? And more recently, we're looking at data privacy and ethical use of data as well. So again, as the industry and the customer expectations and the regulations change, banks need to keep pace. And in, case, in some cases, lead from front as well. The third aspect of us is really about how do we modernize our infrastructure. We have a vast amount of data scientists, analytical users, super users. A lot of them use traditional tools but a lot of them are now using machine learning and AI as well. We saw a presentation from JP Morgan, very consistent story with what we have and other banks have as well, where we are actually truly embracing machine learning and AI as part of our DNA. And it's not about just using the buzzwords, but actually really making significant change internally in all the things we do around processes, but also how do we get the expectation of client well understood 
change our product, change our interface, change our user experience for them as well. Fourth is really the cloud and the adoption of the modern way of doing data analytics. We have a massive amount of legacy estates, 8,000 plus applications across the globe. Data moves at rapid pace in some cases, at snail pace in some cases. But how do you really start moving to and adopting cloud and the associated technologies is really key for us. The other thing also important for us is around how do we commercialize data. So it's not about just the defense side of it or saying what is the hygiene, is the infrastructure appropriate, do we have the modern tools in our all also, but how are we really helping the business grow in their environment as well. So commercialization of our data assets, gaining more insights from it, making sure we're embedding it in decisioning as well as product is really key aspect of it. Last but not the least is really about people and culture. You can have the best strategy in the world, but if you don't have the right people and if you don't have the right culture mindset, it's really hard to transform a complex bank like us. And you know, today's event is a good testament of how HSBC is positioning itself. We do believe a lot in innovation. We do believe a lot in technology, but we are very willing to transform ourselves, and I wouldn't say change the culture, but bend the culture. Because a company as complex as us, if we change too fast, we potentially could break a lot of things inside. And we really take a lot of pride with the legacy and the culture we have. And we want to make sure we can have s small and slight shifts in that so that we can get ready for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Rashid. Mark, you've been working with tons of companies uh, over, over the past. Culture, definitely something very close to your heart. Will you give us an overview of your perspectives and your learnings? Yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, let me briefly speak about myself and my role as a co-pilot, what it takes. Because, you know, actually I'm three in one. So the first thing I, I'm good at is identity you know so originally I was a brand strategist the second thing which is my legacy is being an entrepreneur and the third dimension is something which I feel is also critically important is my training I'm a trained clinical organizational psychologist so I'm a trained therapist for organizations so if you do have a problem speak to me <laughs> you know I'm there for you <laughs> um, and I think this 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 really helps me in helping companies to create a better future. I think there's no doubt, and you know, you being testimony to this, that digital is basically our context. Digital is our world. You know, we live in the fifth country here, possibly towards the end of it, but everything we do is surrounded by digital, by digital technology, everything is enabled by technology. I listened to Harari a couple of weeks ago, and I was deeply impressed when he speaks about human hacking, you know, and what, which kind of impact really, you know, computing technologies, algorithms can create in detecting what do you do, how you are as a personality, and how you strive to the future. One thing which really touched me, and which really made me understand the impact of artificial intelligence and you know what IT can do to our lives was when I was at South by Southwest about two years ago, and I had a conversation with Watson. So you know I'm a trained clinical organizational psychologist, so I should know. And Watson engaged me into a conversation where he tried to find out my personal profile. I thought, okay, let's do that. I can cope. And Watson, during the conversation at one point in time, asked me a very nasty question, which was, Mark, just imagine you walk around a park and you find a $10 note. What would you do? And I thought, well, that's so easy, Watson. I can cope with that. And I said, well, I either leave it on the ground for somebody who really needs it, or I take it and give it to the beggar who is standing in front at the gate of the park. And Watson replied, Mark, how nice of you. If I had a heart, it would be warmed. Incredible. You know, I just fall in love with this machine. And suddenly something touched me, which was, you know, a pure algorithm, and something which I had never thought would be capable or able of being ironic, 
you know, or reflect it in a way that it was really creating some kind of emotion with me. And I think that's the context. So digital is everything. And if we talk about chief digital officers, you know, this is only about people who can understand the context and make use of it for the thing that we really need. Because we have disrupting industries or disrupted markets and we have struggling companies which are really anxious and which are really scared of the future. But they want to survive. And they all, you know, follow the holy grail of transformation. We just asked recently in Germany, you know, and this was, you know, we asked all employees, basically everyone in Germany, because we have an unemployment rate of below 10%, um, whether they feel that whether their company or the company that they work with is in some kind of transformation. And actually, 83% responded, yes. So we've got nearly 90% of people who believe that their company is in the process of some kind of transformation. Actually, search volume, you know, I come from Germany, a company which was once good in football. Search volume for football and transformation is equal now. You know, except when, except when there's a World Cup or something like that. So everybody is into transformation. The problem is, and if you look at, you know, scientific research, 70% of all transformation efforts fail. You know, they don't achieve their objectives. 70%. And if you look at the same research, you know, be it academic or be it done by the big consultancies, you know, why are companies failing? Why do they struggle with transformation? What's the main reason? We've heard it a couple of times today, it's about culture. So 58% of the companies struggle because they can't manage the culture. And this is where our job starts. I think our job, you know, all together. Because what we need to go through is some kind of process where we really detect what made the company originally strong. You know, what are their entrepreneurial roots? What the epicenter of their strengths? And detect this. We use a concept which we call boundary object, which I think is really interesting because it gives you some kind of orientation where you are. It also gives you orientation where you're heading to in the future, but it also tells you what you're not. And from there, you know, this kind of thing which we call identity, you can start to work on your culture and start to describe the journey. First thing that every company needs is kind of a sense of urgency. And I quite liked it when you talked about, you know, bending the culture. But I think it's much more than building the culture. But it's really about understanding if you don't change, you're that. And everybody within the company needs to understand that. But then you need to create some kind of narrative about a better future. You know, something. And Saint Experi once talked about, you know, the fantasy and the desire for the sea which you have to create that makes people move and help them trying to build a boat. And this is what we need to achieve. You know, and then the process is kind of easy, because from there, if you once define that, you can develop your own entrepreneurial platform. You can mobilize the people that are within the company. You can create the right measures to change the culture, evolve it, and then create this kind of beautiful picture of the better future. And just one last remark, and I think that's so easy, because, you know, the, Key thing is really be focused on culture. Be focused on cultural transformation. Forget about digital, because this is just context. So if you think about the chief digital officer and what we just heard from Lindsay, I think that's amazing, because you know my feeling was always that a chief digital officer is somebody who helps transform, who is kind of a catalyst. But actually, you know, I think the involvement, the next stage will be the new CEO, a chief entrepreneurial officer. Somebody like Rowena, actually. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Brexit, let's start with you. So <laughs> two, two years and a bit, all right. Um, what was the ambition when you joined? And uh, obviously in the small group, you know, it stays amongst <laughs> us, so don't be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But how, when you got there, how did it feel like, you know, new environment, immediately was it where did I land am I ready for this role will I ever manage and where are you today yeah that's a good point uh, so a little bit of history I spent 20 plus years in the US so coming to London and a European bank definitely culturally was a little different than what I was used to in the in the US uh, yes you do get overwhelmed when you come to a new role uh, given the complexity of HSBC in a lot of markets and again 
you know, I worked at JP Morgan, which is qu quite complex, quite global as well. But HSBC is different global, as in they have retail banks in each country, and they are significantly important banks in most of the countries they operate in, right? So now, you're talking about almost a conglomeration of multiple banks within a bank, and the center is not just in London, but it's also Hong Kong, because most, most of the revenue, customers, profits come from Asia Pacific and Hong Kong as well. So the most important thing was first 90 days, make sure you listen and understand the whole history and the culture and start to respect w w the legacy of it, right? So that's where you spend a lot of time networking, understanding the problem statement, understanding the opportunities, and then starting to position saying, what should the journey look like? Um, and again, if you chase almost every rabbits and every problems down the hole, you might get busy with a lot of smaller things that are not meaningful and miss the boat on the big ones. So making sure you identify who are the key stakeholders, understanding who are the most important ones as well, because everyone might say, I'm the most important one. <laughs> so working through that was really important. Um, working and re-educating the board around data as an asset. Um, and the importance of data and digital in the future of our company was really key as well. A lot of the executives absolutely understand and agree with what data and digital could do. Sometimes how you execute, how you transform, how you hire the right people is equally important as well. So doing 101, doing a little bit more deep dives with them and educating them is really key in part of that piece as well. But I, say, I think the most important thing also is building the right team under you, right? If you are the only person running around and chasing a lot of these fires, then you potentially get overwhelmed. So making sure that you are hiring the right people under, under you is also equally important too. Thank you. And I think maybe just very quickly for all of us, how big is your team that sort of directly supports you in driving those ambitions? Yeah, so our organization, as I said, is quite complex. We, I would say there's three parts of the uh, organization. One part is I uh, have a, a replica of me, like a CDO for each of the businesses or functions. They are actually embedded in the businesses and functions. So retail bank, commercial bank, all of them have a CDO and they help the business drive their priorities. We have regional CDOs given our global presence for Americas, for Europe, UK, Asia Pacific, because a lot of the work that we have is to deal with the regulators, the local markets, the policies and things. So we want to make sure we have those pieces. The second part really is around our data engineering function. So platforms, building and execution projects, and those things. And third, which is now what we've created, is the whole analytics function as well. How do you start embedding data science into the culture? There have been a lot of analytical community members as well as leaders but bring them together and making sure we, there's a lot of reuse, a lot of leverage across the work that we do is key Thank part you. of it as well. Thank you. Lindsay, out of the amount of people that you've interviewed, mm -hmm. how many, when you put the phone down, said to you, I'm ready to leave, and can you please find me the next CDO role? Or what do they ask you in terms of the next role where they want to go? Or how many of them are at a point where they thought, within the three-year cycle, Maybe I was too ambitious, I need another two years, so I reset for the first year, the rest is, uh, you know, long yeah. breath, and I'm gonna carry on. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, it's actually a bit surprising, perhaps. Um, the majority of folks, so we asked everyone, what do you envision to be your next role after this chief digital officer role? And 42% think that their next job is actually CEO. Now, that could be misunderstood, right? It's not CEO in the company in which they're serving as chief digital officer, but they do see themselves being a CEO next. And it makes sense, right, when you break it down, because these are very strategic leaders. They have high engagement, right, because of the evangelism that's required. And they're operating across all the functions and all the silos and all the business units of an organization. So they're having to think through what are the people practices that are gonna unlock this transformation? How do we think about customers and customer data, customer acquisition and customer monetization? What is our supply chain and how does it need to be modernized? So they actually have a very broad purview and it's particularly interesting because in the last few decades, from a leadership standpoint, we've shifted from valuing general management to valuing functional experts and specialists. And perhaps the chief digital officer role 
has the luxury of a more general management purview. And so perhaps it is a great role to channel into a CEO role next. Now, interestingly, the second most popular answer is they're not done yet. And what they would see themselves doing next is a chief digital officer role in another company or industry. So they would basically take their scar tissue, right, their lessons learned and their experiences from one role to another company and embark on that journey again. Very interesting. Mark, with being a co-pilot and having helped so many companies, um, you know, on your side, I mean, a huge confidence uh, that CDOs or transformation agents bring to you, and obviously asking for help for, you know, a, a leg up, a unique identifier to help them change. When they ask you this question, is the biggest ask on the change to create visibility and mindset share within their own organization? Or how much of that is outside versus inside? I think that's a very good question. If you, if you think about the best CDOs, I think you know, their main task is really changing the organization, but sometimes it's really important to create this outside visibility, you know, yeah. to make them understand, and especially make CEOs understand how crucial it is to support what the CDO wants to achieve. You know, actually, you know, great CDOs are brilliant leaders. You know, actually, you know, they have a, a fantastic capability of creating some kind of fellowship. And as we all know, people follow people. So if, if they are strong in that, and if they evangelize in, in, in a good way, um, they attract people from inside and they attract people from outside. And it's all about building coalitions and ecosystems and partnerships that you really force and form something which is extremely powerful. So basically, you know, I think one follows the other, but you have to focus on both. Thank you. I've been in New York the, the couple of weeks ago, and there's an organization, I call it sort of the AA club of CDOs, right? Where you stand up and say, I'm Ramin Kress, I'm a CDO, <laughs> and please help me who's, who's got the same sort of methodology or problems I share. And I think it is really interesting, I mean, also to the point that you made, I mean, sharing experiences and understanding as to where everybody is on their journey, super, super useful. Now, with the point of I'm not done and here's where I'm going to go next. I want to ask you a question, particularly, you know, in, in sort of a very similar role. I have this hypothesis that if change is a constant, then why not build a club of transformation agents by which effectively you would come and do my job as Henkel and then take where I took Henkel from when I started until now and take it to the next level. I come to HSBC, God help, um, and you know someone else uh, takes the other role. And effectively, if you think about it, this constant learning with a different pair of eyes, maybe one is more consumer focused, one more data focused, you know, could be very, very interesting. Do you think that in an organization that someone like HSBC could subscribe to a rolling two-year or three-year change of those kind of agents? Yeah, it would be open to it. I think uh, it's taken me two years to navigate the organization now, and I think I'm ready for the next phase of what's important for us. So we are actually going through an update to our strategy now, and we, we're sharing that with our technology advisory board that we have independent external advisors who look at us and advise and tell us. So we're going through that actually next week. Um, but, and, and also, not just outside, but inside too. We do promote a lot of mobility opportunities within our businesses. So our CDO for uh, Commercial Bank, who was there for three years, now is the CEO for uh, Retail Bank. And our CDO, who was for Americas, now is the CDO for Global Business and Markets as well. So. You know, for me, if I look at my succession planning as well as building a stronger bench internally, I have to rotate people around and give up opportunities to people. And interestingly, you mentioned that we actually operate in four big banks, and they are culturally very different, right? So it almost feels like you are in a different organization. And we spin people out of geography, so we hired someone from Hong Kong to come and work in the UK for the next six months. Very culturally different, right? So. How do you make sure you build that global kind of talent pool internally? But again, an outside in view is absolutely keen as well. The question is, is that person culturally a fit for us, number one? 
And does he or she have the right courage to deal with the complexity of the organization as well? Thank you. Lindsay, when you did your research out of the 100 plus uh, chief digital officers uh, that you interviewed, what was the gender balance uh, uh, between male, female? Well, unfortunately, uh, the majority of chief digital officers are men, um, and that represents uh, also general executive ranks. Right. Um, although I might point to you over here and congratulate you for having 50% of your leadership team are women. That's exceptional. It stands out. Um, but yes, the majority are men. And when organizations uh, typically come to you and say, we think we're at a point in time where we need a CDO, mm -hmm. how often or how fluent is the organization in being able to describe what it actually is that they're looking for other than the acronym? <laughs> Great question. Um, these are famous meetings that we have. Um, so as, as evidenced by the survey, right, 75% of CDOs will say the company was not yet ready for the transformation when they accepted the remit, right? So you can imagine many months prior when this is even you know, asked of us, you know, should we hire a chief digital officer? There's not yet clarity on the remit, on the role, how it should be scoped, organized, and where it should report. And as such, we really help an organization diagnose what they're solving for. And so it all goes back to like, what is the business strategy, right? What are you trying to achieve? Are we talking about operational efficiencies? Are we talking about revenue? You know, what, how is your cash cow? And how are the revenues declining in that? And how are new business models accelerating? So, you know, it's really around what is the business? How is it performing? And what direction do we want to take it? So it, it's not very clear at all at the beginning. And in fact, as much as we clarify it, it still becomes incumbent upon the CDO to come in, as you said, right, to spend time listening, learning, and further diagnosing what can be. No, uh, absolutely. Um, we've got 10 minutes left. Sorry. Um, <laughs> one of the things that's very close to my heart, and I think, you know, uh, uh, also, Raghav, when we talk about, you know, chief data officer, you know, uh, th there'll be a lot of organizations that think predominantly data, IT, technology, um, <laughs> as opposed to, you know, maybe thinking about it, uh, the value of data, and, you know, at least in our organization, we, we, I saw that when we were talking analytics, and it all became very, um, you know, far away mm. uh, to attach, make it tangible, and larger always ended up in the pot of IT uh, data silos, it is very unsexy, right? Um, Having said that, we then moved this into data for value programs by what actually mm -hmm. everyone within a, a business unit or within a function becomes a data champion, which means he needs to identify data points that create value for the organization. Yet, um, I see many companies by which a data officer or digital officer encroaches the territory of traditionally the CT, the CIO. When you joined HSBC, um, was that something that you felt that you needed to work on to sort of demark where you play, where the others play? Yeah, actually it goes back to the cultural aspect of it. Is technology and data an advantage? a competitive advantage, or is it actually a liability or a, or a service or a provider, right? Uh, traditionally, banks and other legacy organizations have thought through as technology as a follower versus a driver. And I think we, we see very encouraging changes where John Flint, our CEO, now is saying technology is actually one of the key competitive drivers for us. And he's speaking at the AI conference this week, talk about that as well. So. I think it, it, it has kind of evolved over a period of time. And it's not that I struggle when I join. By the way, I do report to the CIO and the COO, right? So on one side, I have to make sure the ownership of the, gov uh, the data, the governance aspect of it. How do we look at commercialization opportunity is more COO, whereas the engineering aspect and the machine learning deployment and architecture is aligned to the CIO. 
And I think that's actually a really healthy mix because then you are bringing everyone along. It's not that you're creating a fracture between I'm only in the business I'm, or I'm only in the IT. I think, as you mentioned also, the CDO has to be an evangelist and has to understand the levers that the company needs to operate and pull, right? Uh, is it a control function? Is it uh, a revenue generation function? Or is it just a spokesperson? Mm -hmm. And I think depending on what you want to do, you have to play the cards appropriately as well. So we're not done. This will always be a challenge, but you have to continue to work towards it. And that's what the most important part of our jobs really is to bring everyone along in this journey. Thank you. To round it up, and I start with you, if you are an entrepreneur, as a person an entrepreneur with an HSBC, what would be the equivalent of your IPO and when? Um, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Well, that's a good one. Um, I would say we would create a data analytic company within, within HSBC, and our focus would be on looking at how we can leverage data and, in, and insights from our company to monetize slash commercialize our assets appropriately. Not necessarily spin off from HSBC, but to really create an independent entity within HSBC and, and become potentially a profit center for the bank. Thank you. Mark. If you were to give the audience and uh, uh, everyone a perspective of what is the first thing that one needs to ask themselves when they're embarking on a transformation, on a change journey as a large corporate to be successful, what would be your advice? Well, I think it's very much about understanding where you want to be heading and what's your future role. So it's about understanding what you're good at and how your culture looks like. So it's really understanding and reading cultures, understanding the key patterns that are underlying. But I think it's also a bit like being an anthropologist and digging deep into what makes your organization one strong. I'm surprised by the amount of companies that do not know where they're coming from. I'm surprised by the amount of corporates that do not know what they're good at and who do not have an idea about their culture. And I think this is really where it has to start. It's not about, you know, find me a good CDO in the first place, oh. but it's rather about this is where I want to go and this is what I am. So that's the future. Thank you. Lindsay, those hundred souls of CDOs, yes. as they're moving on into... Yeah another reset, another organization, further change. Um, the advice that you give the organizations that are approaching you with everything that you have heard, everything that came out of the report, would you still advise companies to go and have a CDO? Or do you see that maybe something else is coming out of it that you can already start, maybe not 100% articulate, which would get a company to the same level faster with less resistance that is maybe not called CDO? There's a piece of advice that I would give, which would be different than just hiring a chief digital officer. And that would be to think of culture as being dynamic. I think one of the fallacies we may have is that it is not dynamic. And by definition, it should be because Organizations are people and organisms in their own sense in an aggregated way, right? And so if we keep just trying to hire for culture fit, then by definition, we're assuming it's not dynamic. And we're also just hiring for redundancy, which therefore excludes any diversity. So I would encourage us all to think about our cultures as being dynamic. And there may be aspects of it that you really want to preserve and nurture and carry forward, and there may be new things that you want to add to it or extend, right? And then just thinking about the new talent that you bring into that organization being additive in that way that will grow and evolve your culture. Wonderful. So in closing comments, I think what we heard, we're not done yet. There's still going to be change. You need creativity, culture. You need support. And uh, we need a lot of courage. Um, but large corporates do have things that they need to leverage and make use of. They usually have a lot of cash flow. They have a lot of legacy. They have an enormous amount of data. 
they have network, and they need to bring this to bear, and they have a fair chance to play a significant role also in the future. Thank you very much uh, for your attendance. I hope you found that useful. Thank you. Thank you.